Good afternoon and good morning to everyone joining us today. I'd like to welcome everyone to our first of two webinars focused on the judicial market. I hope everyone who is watching is in good health and for those less fortunate, we wish you a speedy recovery. I am your moderator, Damian Biltris, the National Business Development Manager for the Judicial and Legal Markets here at Wolf Vision. Uh, joining us today is our very own Marta Scopa, our National Sales Manager, who will be fielding questions and assisting me throughout our webinar today. We also have a very special guest, Paul Pridemore of the Ninth Judicial Circuit of Florida. And today's topics will include the role of technology in the courtroom, as well as the courtroom in a post-COVID-19 world. For those of you who may not be familiar with the Ninth Judicial Circuit of Florida, they have one of the savviest uh, AV groups in the country and were one of the first adopters of the Wolf Vision Synap product line. Uh, throughout our webinar, we're going to welcome all user questions, so please feel free to ask at any time during today's broadcast. We will be answering them as we go. Um, we're looking to have an interactive webinar rather than the traditional, we tell you what to do and you ask questions later. Um, so, but before we start, I want to take a quick moment and see who is in attendance today. We're not going to be calling out any names, but we are curious as to see what type of attendees we have with us today. So. Marta, if you may, can you please put up our first web poll? So Paul, what type of uh, users do you think we'll have? Do you think we're going to gear today more towards uh, CTOs or AV integrators? What do you, what do you think we'll have? Uh, I think you'll have a good mixture of both of those, honestly. That, that's what we're hoping for. And as I see our live polling going on um looks like we have a, a very close race between courtroom technology integrator and reseller and others we do have a few uh, clerk of the courts some ctos and some technical consultants as well so we have a nice mix of users and that's great um to see uh marta if you want to end the poll Fantastic. So Paul, I want to really thank you uh, for joining me today. Um, I want to start off the conversation today by asking you to introduce yourself and tell us a bit about uh, your role at the Ninth Judicial. Sure. Uh, my name is Paul Pridemore. Uh, my role here at the Ninth Circuit is Senior Audio Visual Engineer, uh, which basically means that I get to uh, dream up all sorts of fun ways of using technology in the courtroom, as well as implementing it, installing it, and coordinating it with those who would install it. Fantastic. I'm sure you get a lot of user questions on a daily basis then. Uh, absolutely. My team fields quite a bit, a bit of a uh, bit of call. Great. So as part of our presentation today, I really wanted to explore some of the many roles that technology plays in the courtroom. You know, I recently ran into this article um, that was a few years old, but it's still relevant. Uh, regarding technology in the courtroom, and it's by uh, the articles by Judge Dixon, um, and who really looks at the basic technical expectations that we have going into a courtroom today. And there was a, a quote in there that really stuck with me, and it still um, has a lot of value because um, it goes like this Before the use of courtroom technology, counsel relied on their courtroom presence, oratory, and enlarged exhibits to carry the day. You know, today we courtroom presence and oratory have their place, but litigants will likely need much more to meet expectations of the jury hearing the, their case, um, which is a very interesting quote, because to me, that mo that tells me that besides just bringing in the evidence, it's, it's about capturing their audience and being able to uh, grasp their attention, especially throughout a long court uh, proceeding. Um, how do you think that evidence presentation is used today to keep jurors engaged? Um, so ultimately, I think the engagement is really upon the person that's, that's speaking. Um, for instance, if someone doesn't really know technology and, and isn't as familiar with, let's say, our system, for example, um, and they're fumbling through things that may not keep someone's attention as to the attorney who comes in prepared knows exactly what they're doing, knows their evidence, knows our, our system and can keep things rolling and popping and, and come off, for the lack of a better term, looking like a true rock star in front of their jury. 
And that really also requires to, you know, even before they learn how to use the system, really the, the importance of having a great system in place, such as what you guys have. Um, and I really, you know, but before we talk about integration, I'd like you to first recap for our audience um, how you guys really started. And, you know, you told me a story the other day about um, when you first started, you were rolling carts in the courtroom and you were using up resources. Can you tell us what kind of challenges you were facing um, at that time when it came to evidence presentation? Yeah, so the before, before our, our install now, we had two versions of this. Uh, the first version was roughly about four 32-inch um, mobile monitor carts that would give you a DVD player. Um, it would give you a VGA cable and an HDMI cable. Uh, the problem with, with those logistics were that we had roughly about 70 venues for those four carts. Um, so we, we basically had a staff of two people that were devoted to going into the courtrooms, uh, removing those carts when they weren't in use, delivering them to like a court that needed it for the afternoon session. And, and unfortunately, it was very clunky. Um, the 32-inch monitor isn't very huge when you're talking about someone looking at ac across the room at 20, 30 feet away. Um, and just the noise of trying to pull those carts and, and moving them around, unfortunately, was distracting jurors and, and disrupting court. Um, our second evolution of that was actually a cart-based system, but it had a projector on it. So it solved the solution of everyone seeing in the screens, or sorry, everyone in the courtroom seeing the screen, I, I apologize. But um, it also still supported the VGA cable. It still supported the HDMI cable. And it also gave you speakers. Um, so it was a much better solution, but it still had issues with uh, getting into court reporting. So like how is, how is court reporting being able to hear just a portable set of speakers instead of our system now where it actually integrates into our mixer, which then goes to court reporting digitally, as well as we were still having to support people or send support people in to go get those carts and, and move them around and sometimes in, in operational hours as well. So what would you say was your primary reason for changing all this? Um, it really spar uh, sp uh, spiked and sparked from uh, a need to use or utilize those people that were having to push the carts around in other capacities. Uh, the, other, the other thing that really sparked that change was the evolution of the smartphone. Um, it became... It, 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 the, the social trend kind of seems that people are less and less carrying computers or laptops per se, and more into a mobile device like a tablet or a cell phone, things of that nature. So techni technical evolutions also uh, spark, spark the change as well as the need to utilize those people better. So, you know, you, you've made a lot of great points here about how to meet these needs. Um, can you take us through how your team came up with the criteria? Um, what was your process and decision-making like um, for those out there who are doing this for the first time? So when we, we first started out, there was really three principles that we wanted to cover when we made some changes. And the first one was reliability. Of course, you want something that you're not gonna have to just go in every day and reboot or reset or, or continually have to um, nurture, for a better word. Um, the second thing was um, ease of use. Uh, we have a very broad and dynamic range of users that we have to appeal to, whether it be a seasoned attorney or a brand new attorney. And, and there's lots of them there and there's only four of us. So of the tens of thousands of attorneys that are out there that, that work here, um, we needed a solution that could universally fit those guys. And then we also needed a system that we knew we had to put it out effort at the beginning, beginning of it, but we wanted to become self-reliant or self-supportive. Um, we wanted something that we could train some people with, do some trainings periodically, and then basically allow them or, or empower them, them meaning the attorneys, to be able to utilize the system at how they saw fit and not just the way we were uh, demanding or regurgitating that they use it. Okay. so. You have your criteria set and you decide to start testing out product that's out in the marketplace. Um, what, you know, what was it about the Wolf Vision sign app um, that really 
maybe say, okay, this is our, this is the product for us. I mean, was there an, like an aha moment? They were like, ah, there, there it is. It has you know, everything we need and then some. Um, we tested a lot of stuff. And when we had started to make the decisions beyond our like criteria of what we wanted, uh, we needed something that was uh, connector friendly. Um, to further expand on that, you know, if you look at your na your laptops now, you have USB C that you can use as an output. You have D Display Port, Mini Display Port, HDMI, Mini uh, Mini HDMI. Uh, a lot of laptops out there are still supporting VGA with a 3.5 millimeter for headphones. So we needed to to get something that would be um, consistent across the board. So that's when we decided to look at BYOD devices. Okay. Um, we brought in several types of BYOD devices um, and ultimately came down to two, to two vendors, uh, Wolf Vision being one of them. And we put them in courtrooms that were across the hall from each other. And we probably piloted this for, I would say, a good three months. And it came down to looking at how easy was it for other, every, everyone else to use it, how often did we have to go in and support it, and, and, and those type criteria where, again, we were looking for our base, our, our base criteria, and that's, that's how we came to the decision of integrating the sign up into our evidence presentation. So when you were going through this pilot, uh, you know, you were piloting our, our device, when you were bringing in users, was there a basic training that you gave them, or was it, were you just trying to see how, uh, how easy it was to use? So um, the first step when we first initially started was really just a splash screen that said, this is how you use the device. Um, and then it was reliant on the attorneys or the people using it to ask us for help at that point. Um, and it became because you, because with the sign up, you no longer have to use a, a client or an app in every situation that that it became the the wolf vision was a little bit uh a little bit easier for everybody to grasp and to use okay very good so as, as you see on our next screen here um our sign up family has had some additions since you originally looked at it uh back then it was only the sign up and sign up core which you both you know you utilize both today in your courtrooms how do you decide which product which of the two products fit your, your needs in a courtroom best? Um, I, I utilize le electronics as, uh, and I use the euphemism as a tool. Um, every situation or every um, courtroom, hearing room, conference room, what have you, needs different criteria or different uh, uh, strategies in order to implement something effectively. And, and, and to, and to bring it back to the tool section, if, if you need a, a Phillips head screwdriver, you're not going to reach over and grab a hammer um, in order to, to make that tool work. So it, we, we, we implement the, the sign up mainly in our courtrooms where we need HDMI switching. And then we use the core when it's just something that needs to, to have BYOD. Okay. So besides uh, sign up, you also have a um, Wolf Vision visualizer in your portal, BZ8 Lite. Um, you know, we recently released our first 4K visualizer, the VZ8 UHD, along with which, along with the 9.4F, are two recommended solutions for the courtroom. Obviously, SignUp is not the entire solution, rather than part of it. As you and the team started to design and put your courtroom together, what did you envision the role of the technology to be in the courtroom? Um, basically a principle and tool that expanded upon our cart based systems. Um, and the expansions I mean were like annotation, uh, being able to freeze the screen and use whatever was on the document camera to pass around into the court systems, um, things of that nature. Okay. And being in the, as well as bringing in the BYOD. And, and that's something that's becoming more popular, I believe, with uh, more courtrooms is BYOD. Um, you know, I have a workflow that I want to put up that, that shows a typical courtroom system at the ninth. Can you give us a quick overview of what we have here? Sure. Um, the principle starts the, with the fact that we have a, a on-screen projector, which is an ultra short throw projector and roughly a hundred inch screen that the projector reflects upon. 
Um, we also, in our witness box, because our witness box would be right directly in front of where the projector would be, we have a, a 22 inch uh, touch screen. So no matter what evidence is being presented, the, the person in the witness box doesn't have to turn around and, and look to where somebody's pointing or referencing to, it's right there in front of them. Um, and then of course we have the sign up using the two HDMI outputs to support both of those um, sources, as well as we also have the, the VZ8 light or the, the visualizer working that as well. And then something else that's not on this diagram is, is we also have an input and an output of the um, audio of that so that it integrates directly into our courtroom mixer and gets an input from our microphones for the courtroom mixer as well, or from the courtroom mixer as well. Fantastic, fantastic. You know, I'm sure um, our viewers are curious on how quickly your end users adopted um, the use of SignApp. Can you take, tell us what steps you took and your team took to ensure everyone was trained? And are there any steps that you continue to take today? Yeah, that's a, it's a very lengthy process. So initially what we did was we took our two principal or, or major groups of users, which would be for, for our court system, which would be the state attorney's office, and the public defender's office. And um, everybody wanted to handle it, handle, it, handle it differently. So for the public defender's office, we took groups of 10 and we did, uh, I wanna say it was two weeks. We did um, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, a group of 10 attorneys so that we could do a little bit more of a hands-on approach with those guys. Uh, the state attorney's office, we did two mass trainings where we took every, everyone is, that, that was an attorney at that point, um, and we, uh, we just did the, the bulk trainings uh, with those. Um, with the state attorney's office, we have, um, of course, COVID has kind of changed this, but any, any of their onboarding process with the state attorney's office, they actually uh, do a, a, a quick little training with me as well. Um, we do a 45 minute presentation for their onboarding process. Um, we speak to uh, the Bar Association roughly about quarterly about technology and specifically more, specifically it leans more towards the evidence presentation side of stuff so we get to catch the attorneys before they they come in here and they can kind of you know pick and groom what kind of devices and what kind of stuff they want to bring into the courtroom first um currently right now our, our method is we we have a couple of things uh first of all we have our website which is the ninth circuit.org on our technology support page we have posted instructions uh for the evidence presentation as well as a brief synopsis of it uh, we also have business cards that basically just give our contact information. And so judges, when they see new attorneys that they haven't seen present in our courtrooms, basically give them the card at any pretrial meetings that they would have that says, hey, in order for you to proceed with your trial, you need to talk to these guys and they'll show you how to work the evidence presentation. Um, That's interesting because not a lot of groups do that. Um, you know, there's, and, 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 folks don't understand that, you know, beyond the investment in the technology, you know, investment and training is, is very key to, you know, to success. And really, um, you know, you told us at the onset, it's only four of you that are supporting, you know, over 70 courtrooms. Um, so just in this building, we have eight other complexes, right? So it, it's, it's very important to make sure that that those who come in have an avenue for training. Now, you know, present your presenters, are they typically connecting via an HDMI cable or are they actually going uh, wireless? We are 100% wireless in the Ninth Circuit. Uh, so our, so, some facilities haven't completely migrated over, but anything that we're installing is going to be 100% wireless. So wireless has become a pivotal piece of the courtroom presentation for, for all intents and purposes. Uh, what percentage of users do you think um, at when you first started uh, went and wirelessly as opposed to um, traditional HDMI cable to their device? Um, how many how many users were using HDMI cables originally? Yeah, yeah, just give us a rough estimate of, of you know percentage so of those. For for my for my situations, we only had cable based systems to start off with, so it would have been one hundred percent. Okay, so. So it's, it's been a transition uh, throughout the past several years. Right. Um, you know, I want to have Marta, Marta pull up the, our next poll and, and see what our audience thinks in terms of 
wireless presentation in the courtroom bringing you know BYOD devices. Marta, can you uh, give us our next poll, please? Absolutely, uh, poll coming up. And right after the poll, I have a number of questions from the audience that I would like to ask. So let's do the poll. Fantastic. And um, I have some questions for Paul right after that. Okay, sounds good. Okay, this was wow. quite so quick. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, you know, wireless is, is now looked at a must have uh, in the courtroom today. Um, and, you know, a few think it's not important today, but will be in the future. And 3% uh, believe that there's, that it's not important and don't have any current plans. Um, so if you want, Marta, let's stop sharing our poll and um, proceed with the questions. So right along the side, right along the question about BYOD devices, the question from Damien in the audience, where are the BYOD devices inputted to the system? At the defense, prosecution tables, lecterns? So our court system uses one sign app per courtroom, and that sign app is located uh, roughly in between the witness box and the judge. Um, if you guys have the picture of the main system, it could probably give you a little bit better, better visual. But essentially, the BYOD is just um, in a rack that's located in between the witness box and the judge. And when users come in your courtroom, they essentially see something like what we have on screen right now. Um, can you tell us a bit more of, of the security on BYOD? Um, yeah, so there's a few tools that we utilize. Um, this is a typical uh, screenshot of how people would connect to our system. Um, so first of all, it labels the courtroom and it, and it gives it to, its Wi-Fi SSID. Um, and then we have an IP address right next to that. Um, and that IP address is mainly for control. Um, and then there's the, the sign up name itself and then the four digit password. So in order to get on to the wireless portion, you would have to um, select the courtroom Wi-Fi and then type in the Wi-Fi password, which is located uh, directly on the document camera just out of view so that you can't, uh, can't see it from anywhere uh, as far as the gallery or, or, or anyone that's not a, a, a participant in the courtroom. Um, the four digit pin at the end is required for all mobile devices, or at least that's how I program it. So that if you're going to uh, share BYOD and it's, and it's a, a laptop, sorry, if it's a uh, tablet or a phone, then you have to input the four digit code in order to get um, logged on. And then the other piece that is the, uh, uh, the 192.168.1.1, is something that we use for control. Um, so if you log on to the Wi-Fi area and then you type in that IP address, you can actually use your phone or any other system to actually control the little tiles. So if you look on screen, you see a red, a green, and a yellow tile. You can actually change who's the forefront or the background of those, those pictures. Um, but to go along with security, uh, we also uh, change the Wi-Fi range or, or, or uh, decibel reading so that we make it just inside the gallery. So basically, if you step across the threshold from the attorney tables to the gallery, we start to give you signal degradation. So you cannot just connect from the gallery as well as we also use the Bluetooth tracking uh, function that's in there. And that also goes off of the Wi-Fi range as well. Um, so if with a mobile device, you have to both be in the, the Bluetooth range as well as hit the Wi-Fi range. Um, and that helps prevent someone like say a profile uh, in, in a high profile case uh, to be sitting in the gallery and just try to disrupt the, 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 the flow of, uh, of evidence or even potentially cause a problem with the jury itself. Which is a very important tool because I mean, we've seen, especially in some nationally televised uh, trials where um, 
attorneys were bringing in someone over you know Skype, for example, and all of a sudden you have folks calling in to the to the call and disrupting it. We're seeing it today with Zoom bombing uh, as well. Yep. Um, and that actually happened to us in a very high profile case as well. Right. So um, I, we are inundated with questions. Thank you to the audience. This is great. Um, I, I wanted to let everyone know that all the questions, even the ones I'm not able to get to, will be answered via email. Paul, c can you just answer a couple of more things for me? Yep, so absolutely. Question from Matt. Does every courtroom have its own dedicated VLAN? Um, so we don't, we don't uh, isolate VLANs via courtroom. We, we isolate them via necessity. So we have a VLAN that's dedicated just to video conferencing that hits every courtroom. We have what we consider a normal, a normal traffic or, or a court admin VLAN traffic that's mainly gauged towards uh, judges' computers, uh, things of that nature. And then we also have a dedicated AV network that um, we have that's just, just basically for any, any appliance that we would stack onto the network. Um, and to expand off of that question and tying that back into the security, um, it, it's a pretty neat feature that we are able to um, allow people to connect to our sign app. But being a government uh, installation, we can't let anyone on our network. So having the ability to allow people to connect to our device, but yet not be able to get beyond that um, is, is, is a pretty interesting uh, security feature as well. Okay. Next question from Mark. So there is no internet for the device while connected to the sign up, question mark. That is correct. So uh, we, we, um, we basically in the attorney trainings instruct everyone that they need to have their evidence be a physical uh, means, whether it be a USB stick, whether it be on their computer itself, or uh, what the common use is, is that a, a lot of people use a USB um, DVD drive and they, they, they supply their evidence in that, in that respect. So no, we do not allow any outside internet connection because I cannot allow that. Question from Thomas. How many sources can you have displayed on the screen at the same time? So it's four sources, any combination of the following devices. For me, it's the document camera, a tablet or cell phone or a laptop. And, and, and it doesn't matter whether it's Mac or PC, and it doesn't matter whether it's Apple or Android. You can have any combination of those devices. And before we move on, last, last question from Monty. Uh, Paul, how many people do you have for support a number of video units? A number of video units like uh, I'd have to ask a follow-up question to that one. Does he mean video units as far as like video conferencing? Or are we talking about like how many synapses we have? I think we may be referring to synapses. Uh, so we have installed, well, I have 45 synapses on site now and 33 of them, I believe are installed now, 32, 33, something like that. And how many people do you have to support that? Four. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Martin. You know, um, one of the things that I personally love about SignUp is the fact that it is 100% device agnostic when it comes to wireless presentation. Uh, we're fully compatible with AirPlay, Chromecast, Miracast. And we also have our vSolutionCast uh, app uh, for those with older devices which may not be able uh, to connect to any of those protocols. Um, you know, security is always a top concern for all of our IT groups, regardless of the size of their courthouse. Um, and we, we, you know, we kind of broached the subject with uh, using the pen and controlling the uh, decibel level on the on the antennas. Uh, but I really want to know from our audience what uh, what the top concern for IT groups, regard you know, are um, in the courtroom today. So, Marta, if you can please uh, give us our next poll. I'd appreciate it. Uh, 
Uh, so we have uh, unauthorized access as uh, leading the pack and disruption of evidence uh, seem to be our top two. Uh, the three quarters of our group um, really believes unauthorized access is is the biggest concern and that is fully understandable. So if we can end the poll, Martin. Thank you very much. So, you know, as robust as the feature sets are on the sign app, uh, one of the key area of emphasis is on security. And our team back in Austria has done a fantastic job of making sure that users have the confidence that we have a product that is secure and is not really opening up doors for hackers or anyone else in the courtroom or courthouse to, to really come on. Um, you know, we also offer our vSolution Link Pro software, which allows enterprise level management. And I know, Paul, you're a big user of, of this software. Can you tell our users a bit about this? Um, excuse me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's basically a back office software. Um, I can remote manage any device, um, no matter what campus it is. Um, Basically, I can do firmware updates. I can restart the, the sign app. Um, and in fact, they just added a new feature where you can actually have a timer um, and have them reboot every morning if you wanted to or weekly, monthly, daily. Yep. Um, we can push firmware updates for it. And one of the, the things that we've been using the, the most is that you can extract a programming from one and save it as a template and then import it into new devices. So basically all you have to do is just change the, uh, the, the room designation and, and push the firmware that, or push, push the, the software that way. Hey, so we've, Paul? We've Go ahead, Martin. I have a couple of questions on a slide that, that fit well here. So um, question from Francis. Paul, do you, have, do you or your staff experience issues with HDCP on your devices? Uh, we do not. Uh, so output number two on the sign up goes directly to a Dell 22 inch monitor and HDMI one outputs straight to um, an Atlona Balin that goes to an NEC ultra short throw projector. So everything is pretty, pretty simplified coming out of the sign up. And so we, we haven't really received uh, any, any tricks as far as HD, HDCP issues. And from Damien, do you offer screen capture to add or record? We do not. But you um, can. So our biggest, our biggest directive was not to get in the, the chain of custody for evidence. Um, and that's why I referenced the um, IP address, the 192.168.1.1 that we have for every sign app. Uh, you can actually, and this is what I teach people, is if you use your cell phone as the control device, not only do you have a little bit more seamless of control, but you also have the ability to, if someone annotates, to take a screenshot of that, and then they can actually submit that evidence, that as in that, that screen capture in as evidence uh, straight to the clerk. We do not offer recordings or uh, screen captures on the sign app. So question from Joe, what about DRM input items? DRM input items. So digital uh, media, rights media. Yeah, and so we haven't implemented anything as far as that goes yet. Um, the only expansion off of what we've talked about before uh, that we use for the sign app is that we have a couple of judges that actually plug their USB stick into the front of the, the sign app and use um, jury instructions in those regards. Um, as well as we also have so, a, a couple of uh, USB thumb drives out there that support like external videos, um, say for instance, for traffic court um, and, thing, and things of that nature. Um, so, but those are all played locally by the staff that's in the courtroom as well. We don't have- And, and typically courtroom content doesn't have any media rights on them right. because they're, they're locally created. Um, so that, that shouldn't come into play in the courtroom. Yeah, now, a, a large part of the, the media content that we get in here, um, you, of course you get like depositions of people being interrogated or, or, or questioned. Uh, you, get, you get a lot of like police video shots, 
either from their car or their cam. Um, you get some surveillance video footage that's been converted uh, from, the, from the means that it was at the store or restaurant or, or business that it was at. Um, so that, that's a, a large bulk of our, our, our evidence. And just the last one before we go any further, um, a question from Sue. Um, can you, and if you can, how do you annotate on presented evidence? Um, so that's a great question. Um, really, it's just a matter of tapping the touch screen that we have um, that's in the witness box. If you hold that down for three seconds, it pulls up a little, almost looks like a little sunflower almost with circles around. And you uh, have the ability to ch uh, select your color um, and select your the thickness of, of what you want to uh, highlight or, or annotate with, and it, it just touch the screen and away you go. Um, with that particular function, if you no longer touch the touch screen for, I want to say it's like six seconds after that, then the annotation will automatically go away. Great. Um, you know, we, we touching back on security, uh, you know, we've discussed the pin, we've discussed um, the uh, bandwidth uh, strength on the on the antennas. Now, is there anything else that you do to lock the machines down? Uh, every machine has its own uh, has a pin, so you can't get into the user settings uh, or or the the service settings, I guess, if you will. Um, there is a li little bit of a user menu that you can play with, where you could select like the annotation or, or that kind of stuff. Um, but all all of our hard settings are locked down uh, and. It's a password that only my staff has so that nobody can get into it. Um, Very good. You know, one of our other key features on the sign up is the ability to control presentation feeds coming in or out of other sign up or sign up for the devices. You know, with our vSolution matrix feature, uh, we can provide the ability to distribute content over the network. And Paul, I know that this isn't part of your evidence presentation process today. But a lot of our customers request that the judge and attorneys preview evidence prior to presenting to the rest of the courtroom. That way they can assure that evidence is admissible. Um, you know, with vSolution Matrix, we can provide that functionality. And as you can see on the screen, um, we can first send out content to our preview group. Uh, and then once the evidence is agreed upon and, and deemed admissible, it can be sent through to the publish group just by selecting a, a simple preset. Um, and also in this post COVID-19 world where we will continue to see uh, social distancing, this feature can be used to send content to other courtrooms, uh, a jury room. You know, today jury boxes, you know, have us sitting inches apart and, you know, that's gonna probably have to change um, in order to, to move with proceedings. Um, you know, and, and in addition to our vSolution matrix, uh, we also offer a variety of tools that can be found on the sign app, such as our native Zoom um, integration, Microsoft Teams integration, uh, which will be coming out in the next few months. We can connect to uh, third party conferencing uh, soft codecs using our WebRTC feature. We also have an Office 365 uh, integration that I believe you guys utilize, um, which allow you to access any of your OneDrive files um, through SignApp. Uh, you know, I, I recently spoke to a CTO in Michigan, and one of the things that he told me, which I found interesting, was that anyone conducting a Zoom meeting um, has to stream live to YouTube. And, and I was really happy to hear this because um, as I proceeded to tell them, not only can we inherently connect to Zoom, but using our webcasting uh, feature, we can stream out to YouTube Live, um, Wowza, um, et cetera. Um, and lastly, you know, we have our vSolution meeting, which I know today the focus is on the courtroom, uh, but however, sign up is also a great fit for conference rooms as well. And with vSolution meeting, uh, you can book a conference room using your calendar app. Uh, you can load all the files prior to uh, to sign up through that calendar app so that when you go into your meeting, all files are accessible and you don't have to fidget around with with really um, you know looking up these files. Now, um, our last poll of the day 
is really going to uh, look at video conferencing and the the importance of it. You know, COVID-19 has really changed the way we operate. And Zoom is a verb like Google now. Um, so I'd like to ask our audience, how often do you use video or web conferencing to reach remote participants today? Well, so nearly 100% of our audience today um, is using some sort of web conferencing application um, to, to conduct uh, meetings. I know we have, um, we've met through, through Zoom uh, on several occasions. You know, moving forward, what do you think uh, the way, you know, technology is envisioned in a courtroom, uh, even with how you've done it, you know, do you see that changing? Um, yeah, I mean, First of all, technology in general, not just court technology, is always going to be an ever-changing flow of things. Um, but how it's going to particularly impact the courts, we're going to have to just kind of see how we come back and what our new norm is and, and adapt and adjust to that. But I foresee a lot more video conferencing and a lot more group, group uh, uh, or virtual uh, hearings and things of that nature um, probably coming coming faster than we, we expect. So Can what I, type of, sorry, go ahead, Marta. Okay, um, I have a whole bunch of questions regarding unified communications and, and I'll pose them to Damien first and then both to Damien and Paul. Um, let me ask all of them together and, and you can answer as you see fit. First from Damien, plans to integrate WebEx teams to the unified unified collaboration offerings. Second question, what about SIP or H2323 Polycom integration? What about Google Meet tie-in? Is there a path for using Starleaf? Thank you. So a lot of the questions are, are really going around WebRTC. Um, uh, you know, we, we do have an integration with Microsoft Teams that is forthcoming. Um, but all the other um, all the other solutions mentioned are WebRTC solutions. I know that we've tested um, Cisco's WebEx, uh, Citrix GoToMeeting, uh, Clear One's uh, Space has also been tested, and and all work uh, using our WebRTC functionality. Um, I don't know. Are you using the SIP and H.323 functionality? Are you doing anything? For us, call? we, we yeah. do use that, but we, it's not integrated with the sign app, though. Okay. Um, and, you know, going back to, to operation post-COVID, what do you, you know, do you, are there particular types of cases that right now are being looked at to being conducted over a video conference, or is it all, or are you just waiting it out? Um, a, lot of, a lot of the majority of the stuff is just kind of waiting it out. Um, we have strict guidelines from the Supreme Court that we're, you know, have to function under. Uh, right now for us, it's, it's our domestic violence division is, is still going forth um, and arraignments and first appearances are, are the, uh, the bulk and the majority of the work that's being done. Um, I do know that there are sporadic hearings and, and, and proceedings going on uh, via video conferencing and stuff like that as well. But for uh, right now, our, our main focus is just to make sure that those guys are not. Okay. Marta, are there any more questions? So there are a couple of more questions. Um, one has to do directly with post-COVID-19, uh, which is uh, how do you plan to accommodate social distancing in a courtroom? if one is necessary? Um, crazy enough that that decision is for someone that's way beyond my, my, uh, my capacities, uh, but I would assume that um, most of our jury boxes are a little bit larger, so there'll be, you know, a juror per every couple of spaces. I, I can assume that there's going to be, like, um, spaces out on the sidewalk, things of that nature, but 
a lot of that is going to be way above my pay grade. Question from David here. Um, assuming that you have some sort of a roadmap for upgrades and updates, does the current situation change your technology plans for the future? Um, I would say that it's propelled uh, a lot of our need for technology change as well as it's also helped fuel that. Um, because we have less judges on the bench, it gives me a lot more time to play and a lot more time to, to utilize stuff. Um, we did have a strategic meeting this morning about some things that we wanted to talk about for upgrades and stuff like that. So yeah, it, it, this has definitely been a unique experience and I'm sure everyone can say that no one's ever seen anything quite like what we've had. And it, it, it does require you to think a little bit more, um, abstractly and a lot more outside of the box than, than just, Hey, this is a cookie cutter install and we need to think about just doing this. But we have been trying to incorporate the whole gamut of things with all of our installs anyways. So I would say we were, we were, we were closer to being prepared than, than some, but that doesn't mean that we were a hundred percent prepared. And I don't think anyone was you know, yeah. prepared for something of this level. Right. So, um, Marta. Um, Okay, one more. Uh, is there a, from Michael? Is there a plan to roll these advances in phases throughout the year, especially with the distributors like ourselves? So I'm assuming Michael is a part of our uh, system integration channel. Okay, and roll out as ter as in terms of what uh, features. I guess Michael, uh, I'm reading it as though he's asking if you are planning to upgrade more courtrooms in the future this oh. year? Oh. Uh, yes, I'm currently got, I'm just spitballing here, but about, about six projects that we're juggling right now. Oh yes, uh, all the courtrooms here at this, at this facility will, will get our evidence presentation and we'll get also our, our sound mixer and, and sound reinforcement upgraded. Yes, absolutely. Question from Amit. Uh, it can sign up accommodate HD or 720p content and upscale to 4K. Yes, I mean, it, it can take in 720 and, and I mean, it's not gonna make the image any better. Um, it will just pass it through. I mean, we can output up to 4K, but it's, uh, we're not if, if the if the video is 720 i mean or if it looks grainy i mean it's going to look like that we can't control um the quality of the video itself but it will play through it yes that's what i have that's all i have for the moment fantastic fantastic well paul i want to thank you for joining us today um yeah. and providing your insight i know lots of folks look towards the ninth judicial circuit um, and what they're doing courtrooms tech from a technical perspective. I also want to thank all our viewers today uh, for taking the time out of your day to participate in our webinar. Uh, next week, we will be hosting another webinar, uh, and our special guests are going to be Ben Cobble of Clayton County Courts in Georgia, as well as Jade Cauldron of BIS Digital. Uh, for more information, uh, please feel free to reach, you know, reach out to me um, at damian.biltris at wolfvision.us. Um, I hope that everyone remains uh, safe and healthy uh, throughout the rest of this uh, COVID-19 crisis. And we look forward to having you on next week. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thanks, Paul. No problem. Thank you for having me.